Well, hello there, YouTube. Please help us out by liking this video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. It was a short slate on Monday, but oddly enough, I feel like there's a lot to talk about. I, I don't know why I always do this, but anyway, we're going to talk about all of it up next on FBT. Whoa there, Garrett Mitchell with a massive game here on Monday. Let's get to it. Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today. On Tuesday, August 30th, Frank Stample joined by the Scotty Dub, Scott White, today on the show. We had a bunch of struggling pitchers on the mound. Are we worried about any of them down the stretch? Let's find out. We've got Corbin Carroll's debut. Name that player. Little game for you, Scotty, a little bit later on. Team name Tuesday and much more. Like I said, Scott, I mean, whenever I have this short slate, I have this weird thing in my mind where I feel like I need to jam pack the rundown or else we're not going to be able to fill it, which is definitely not true. So I don't know why. I yeah. Do. <laughs> I mean, you could probably have no rundown and we could still fill an hour. Yeah, I, I don't. So. I don't know that it'd be an hour anybody wanted to listen to. Just me going like box score by box score and whatever yeah. happens, happens. Yeah. 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 Who knows? Maybe the people actually prefer it. Anyway, let's get to today's action. Oh my good goodness gracious! Oh my goodness gracious! I am going to steal what I think is the breadstick of the night. Garrett Mitchell, the Brewers outfield prospect who got called up over the weekend, and he had a pretty big game here on Monday. He went one for three with a sock and a shoe. The steal actually came on a pickoff attempt where he just took off, and he was too fast. The first baseman tried to throw him out at second, but he was too late. Uh, so showing off the wheels, and then later on, a clutch two-run homer in the eighth inning, 110-mile-per-hour exit velocity. It went 414 feet. Obviously, his first career home run, Scotty, and... I don't want to overreact to this because I agree. You pointed out that he hits the ball on the ground way too much in his minor league career, but yeah, 10% rostered widely available. So it could be out there in some deeper leagues, those five outfielder league formats. The kid clearly has some physical tools. So I'm, oh, yeah. I'm mildly excited about Garrett Mitchell. Uh, what do you think about him? Yeah. I, I mean, he has raw power. He does. He was kind of, you know how they always show that clip of Aaron Rodgers sliding in the draft and, you know, he looked like he could be a top five pick. I'm talking about when he was drafted out of college and then he slides to late in the first round. Like Garrett Mitchell had the baseball equivalent of that experience in the, uh, in the 2020 draft sliding to 20th overall. Uh, but it's it's because he did have this this sort of odd feature about him where like it's clear at some point in his life he was coached that to maximize his speed he needs to hit the ball in the dirt leg out infield singles that sort of thing and uh to to get to that raw power it was going to take an overhaul of his swing at least in theory and judging by the minor league numbers, I would say that overhaul hasn't happened. We're talking about a near 60% ground ball rate. He had between three minor league levels this year, five home runs and 289 plate appearances. I mean, it was a, it was a solid poke, as you pointed out, Frank. 110 mile per hour uh, home run. For Garrett Mitchell, and I, I hope he can do more of that. But I'm, I'm very skeptical. He's, he is fast, clearly, and it's nice to see him putting that to good use right away. I'm also skeptical he's going to play against left-handed pitchers. Him being a left-handed hitter himself. Uh, let me see, Tyrone Taylor, who had been playing center field. He's of course a right-handed hitter, and his numbers aren't great against lefties. So, you know, I always say talent. If if I always say if 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 the the higher talented guy performs, those playing time issues will take care of themselves. But we're talking about only five weeks left in the season. So is there enough time for Garrett Mitchell, even if everything goes right, to make to to become a trustworthy fantasy option? I kind of doubt it. But if you're talking about a five outfielder league where stolen bases are the priority, then sure, he's he's somebody to look into there. And I. I made sure to put in a, in a claim for him in, in all of those leagues that I play in. Yeah, maybe I'm a little bit more excited to talk about Garrett Mitchell at the top here, Scott, because I picked him up in two of my deeper leagues, 15-team, five outfielder leagues on Sunday, and 
I threw him right into the lineup. So <laughs> first game in the lineup and he's, he comes out swinging and doing all this. Like, yeah, I'm pretty excited. Small sample size on Garrett Mitchell in the minors. Um, 2021, 17, 17 at bats against lefties. Again, it's really small. 294 batting average, 983 OPS. And then this season in the minors, he had 46 at bats against left-handed pitching, 295 batting average, 892. So for what it's worth, again, small sample, Garrett Mitchell has been very good against lefties, at least in the minors. So I don't know that he'll play against them with the Milwaukee Brewers, uh, but worth mentioning, he's been all right there so far. He is 10% rostered once again, and just comparing him to some of the most added outfielders, Scott, obviously we're taking Lars Newbar. We're taking Corbin Carroll over him. Uh, personally, I would take Oscar Gonzalez. Uh, but once you get into like Jake McCarthy, Jake Fraley, TJ yeah. Friedel, names like that, like I'll take Garrett Mitchell over those guys. Yeah, I think so too. I, I was getting jazzed up for Jake Fraley, but the Reds have gone back to sitting him against left-handers. So Garrett Mitchell could make a big impact in stolen bases in a short period of time. And so I, I think if if you approach him with that mindset, and 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 don't really expect anything more than that. It's it's possible he'll deliver more than that. But if that's your expectation, this is a steel specialist in for me in a roto league where I have five outfields their spots to fill. And then I think he'll probably be fine. I, I'm not going to guarantee he's going to give you a dozen steals or anything, but it's at least possible. All right. Oh my goodness gracious! For you, you got an outfielder of your own. Yeah, I do. I'm going to go with Tyler O'Neill, who had a two homer game here on Monday, and that gives him five home runs now in his past seven games. Prior to those seven games, he had seven home runs all season. So I don't know what's gotten into Tyler O'Neill. We've been waiting for this all year. Of course, he looked like he looked like a huge source of well, he was long he long profiled as a huge power source and finally made good on it last year homering 34 times in 138 games and uh the data suggested that wasn't going to be a questionable part of his profile going forward uh, but the power hasn't been there for him this year until these last seven games with five home runs i don't know what more to say about it than that but it, it's it's certainly interesting we can't rule out tyler o'neill being a difference maker here over the final five weeks. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at his numbers just for the month of August, and he's only hitting 222. He now has seven home runs in the month. Strikeout rate is right around 22%, so that's actually really good for Tyler O'Neill. Average exit velocity, 92.6. All right, that's really good. Barrel rate, 13%. Both of those numbers are only going to go up after this two home run game, so... Uh, yeah. Again, not much actionable. He's still 91% rostered, but you know, if maybe you were on the fence about playing him or anything like that, uh, it looks like he's turning it back around. So uh, could potentially make a, a big impact down the stretch here. That is Tyler O'Neill. Um, we saw what he could do last year. So perhaps we're starting to see some of that player once again here down the stretch. Some honorable mentions for Oh My Goodness Gracious. Just got to talk about Corbin Carroll's debut, what he did. He went, uh, as of now, one for four. He had uh, two runs scored, two RBI. His first hit was an opposite field double. It was a two-run double, and um, it was lefty on lefty. I thought that was pretty interesting as well. He was going up against a left-handed reliever in a you know pretty big spot in the game at the time. And then he also showed off his speed. It's got a few times on, on ground balls. There was like a high chopper hit to Gene Segura, which he kind of fumbled a little bit, and then Corbin Carroll was safe as a result of it. So I don't want to overstate. Like you know, we're not going to follow every single thing he does every single day, but. It's his first game, yeah, and he's up to 67% rostered, which I think makes sense. Well, he did just have the one hit, but two RBI, two runs scored. I yeah. mean, it was a productive game for Corbin Carroll and fantasy, and, and yeah, he showed off some of the skills. None of the balls were hit especially hard, but sample of one, I'm not going to make a big deal of that. Yeah, I, I mean, speaking of the Diamondbacks, too, in that game, just, oh my goodness gracious real life baseball they were down seven zip they're now winning 12 seven it's like how often do you see that in baseball i feel like it does not happen that often in fact i heard on the broadcast that they have never won a game where they trailed by seven or more runs and it certainly looks like they're about to do that wow so, 
Yeah. Hmm. Pretty crazy stuff for the Arizona Diamondbacks. By the They've way, around almost 25 years now. That's <laughs> that's surprising. Somebody in the YouTube comments yesterday, Scott, yelled at us. Like, how can Corbin Carroll be a league winning player? You guys say that about too many players. I think we only said it about like Vaughn Grissom recently. And technically, he's kind of played like that since being called up. Like Corbin Carroll, if he didn't get called up this year, I mean, I guess he'll still have prospect status for next season. He is the number one prospect in the game. He's the number one fantasy prospect. Like, if this isn't a player that could be a league winning winning player at this point, then who is, right? That's available mm-hmm. on the waiver wire. So I don't know. I yeah. just kind of wanted to, I guess, defend our statement that he could be a league winning player. It's like this is a real legit fantasy prospect. So I just yeah. well, wanted and to hammer that home. To be fair, uh I wouldn't say he's he's not the universally considered the number one prospect universally top five i would have him as number one and i know i'm not the only one but you know even if even if you're talking top five prospect getting called up who is capable of contributing in all five categories then uh yeah i mean that's that's a potential potential game changer potential league winner uh, all of that you know potential is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in that sentence. And we've seen uh, lately, it seems like the higher profile, the call up, the less impactful he he is right away. But that doesn't mean you assume he's not going to be, you have to, you have to give yourself a chance at that kind of upside. Yes, I agree, Scotty. So just had to defend that point. He's still 67% rostered. So could be out there in a few shallower leagues. That is Corbin Carroll. A few other honorable mentions, lots of, oh my goodness gracious stuff going on here. On Monday, Aaron Judge hit his 50th home run, the second player in American League history to get to 50 homers before September. Obviously, Roger Maris was the other one to accomplish that feat. And then O'Neill Cruz destroyed a three-run homer off of Corbin Burns. That is now his second home run off Corbin Burns in the past two or three weeks. He did it recently as well. 117.5 miles per hour off the bat for O'Neill Cruz on that home run. He had three batted balls in this game over 113 mile per hour exit velocity. They all came against Corbin Burns, who is by all accounts, one of the best pitchers in baseball. So we were talking beforehand, Scott, and it's, it's kind of weird to talk about because O'Neill Cruz has not really been great from a fantasy perspective. You know, he's had some mm-hmm. moments. He's, I guess he's been okay in a categories league. He's giving you a little pop and a little bit of speed, batting average, strikeouts, they're huge issues. He's a flawed player right now. But when he does something like this, we have to acknowledge it because, I mean, he's doing something that really only, what, five, ten players can do in the game and, you know, impact the ball as hard as he does. Nobody's impacted the ball harder than his hardest impact ball. Yeah, I mean, his max max EV is the the most in StatCast era. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. And, and so, like... There are no fantasy leagues I know of that score exit velocity. So it's exactly. Yeah. I I mean, I don't want to. um, And I don't think we have. uh, I I don't want to suggest O'Neal Cruz is a world beater or even a must star player right now. He's not. He's uh, in, in some leagues, I would say he's difficult to even roster. But what it does show is is the upside in a lot of fantasy baseball analysis more than any other sport i would say is is future minded is is uh forecasting and uh projecting ahead and you know particularly as the season winds down and more and more of our listeners fall out of the race they're they're thinking about next year and uh from that perspective it's almost helpful if if o'neill cruz doesn't doesn't uh surge to the finish line here because it, it'll suppress his value for next year and make him even even more of a sleeper pick yeah i see i kind of see both sides of that scott because if you have o'neill cruz in a dynasty league you probably want to see him do something right and improve oh, yeah well sure if you already have him right <laughs> uh but no i hear what you're saying right like keep the cost yeah. down for for redraft next year uh but that is o'neill cruz he's down to 75 percent rostered so like you said like you're saying scott i mean there are formats where he doesn't need to be rostered a head to head points league where you get penalized for strikeouts. 
you know, O'Neill yeah. Cruz is, is not going to make that much of an impact in that shallow of a format. So uh, I think his 75% roster rate actually makes a ton of sense. Let's talk about a few other hitters here, Scott. Some waiver wire hitters from Monday's action. Two outfielders. I mean, I talked about Tommy Pham a lot recently. He's really just continues to perform, uh, you know, leading off for the team. He went two for four with a run scored, 70% rostered. He's played really well since joining the Boston Red Sox. And speaking of that, like Fran Mel Reyes has kind of done the opposite. Um, well, not the opposite, technically. He's done the same thing with the Chicago Cubs. Since joining them, he's played very well. Two for four. He's now played 20 games with them. He's batting 291 during that time. He's got three homers. A 26% strikeout rate is much more manageable. 57% rostered is Fran Mel Reyes. Do you think these numbers need to be higher, Scott? Tommy Pham, 70%. Fran Mel Reyes, 57%. I would say not really. I think I think they're okay. I don't think either of them is must start regardless of the format you're talking about and I think if the roster rate were that much higher then you know we'd be talking about them more in that respect. It could be a little higher maybe, but you know, we're also at a point in the season where a lot of people just aren't paying attention to their teams anymore. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, don't do that. <laughs> Play out the season and keep updating your team. Tommy Pham, by the way, is the 26th ranked outfielder in Roto slash categories leagues this season, which I think just kind That's... of speaks more to how bad the outfield position is this year. But he's yeah, that's hard to believe. He's been a solid player. It's just I mean, it's been a really, really bad position this year. Anything with these three, Scotty, Luis Renjifo. I mean, the guy just continues to play well. He hit another home run here on Monday. He's 36% rostered. He's got four different position eligibilities on uh, CBS. And uh, really, since the start of July, he's he's been really good. He's like back close to 300. He's got seven home runs. He's got four steals. Pujols, Pujols, by the way, just awesome stuff right now, too. He went two for four. He had his 15th home run. 694 now for his career. He's two away from A-Rod. Fourth place all time. Um, that that's what he's approaching. And then now he's now six away from 700 as well. He's 33% roster. He's been great in the second half. Kesson here, Scott, we haven't mentioned at all recently. He went one for three with his 14th home run. He actually replaced Roddy Telez. So here didn't start this game. You know, Roddy Telez left. He might be dealing with something. So maybe uh, more playing time coming for Kesson here, but he's got eight, eight home, uh, four home runs over his last eight games. Anything with those three in particular, Renhifo, Pujols and Kesson here. It's knee discomfort that Rowdy Telez left with. So that's pretty vague, but you know, you could see it sidelining him for a stretch, in which case Hero becomes pretty interesting. I mean, Hero's power production has been fine all year. He just hasn't been able to play consistently enough for anybody to take advantage of it in fantasy. And uh I, I mean, really, it started way back in spring training. Remember, he's he started getting hyped as a sleeper with his performance yep. then. Um, but he just never got a chance to to play consistently enough. The strikeout rate is still through the roof, so it, it's it's one of those situations where you get you're getting exceptionally hard, consistent contact, and is that enough to to make up for the forty percent strikeout rate? Well, if Telez is down, maybe maybe we're about to find out. Uh, and, and if Telez is down, then Hero's roster rate will deserve to be higher than thirteen percent. He, he could be like another for ML Reyes, potentially, in that scenario. Albert Pujols, I mean, off to a good start as one of my sleeper hitters for this week. And this wasn't even one of the left-handers on the schedule. So, feeling pretty good about that one. Kesson Hira, I was just checking out the splits for him. He's actually crushing right-handed pitching. I, I guess the normal assumption would be right-handed hitter, you know, they, they play him sometimes against lefties to give Roddy to let the day off. But, that's usually what they play him against is lefties. And it's it couldn't be further from the truth this season. Uh, I'll pull yeah. up the updated numbers here because he had another home run off of a righty here. Uh, so against lefties this season, Kesson here is hitting 171 with a 565 OPS. Against righties, he is hitting 303, 11 of his 14 home runs, and now an 1100 OPS against right-handed pitching. <clears throat> Somebody needs to show Craig Council those numbers. <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty interesting. So 
deeper leagues, all right, maybe you actually could add Keston Hero, but he's a name to watch. Like, let's let's just see yep. where this goes. Some deep league outfielders. Corey Dickerson went three for five with a home run, and he now has 16 hits. 16 hits over his last seven games. It's absurd what Corey Dickerson's doing right now. Uh, he's 5% rostered. And then TJ Friedel is an outfielder with the Cincinnati Reds. He went one for four with a home run. And over his last 15 games, he's getting a chance to play. He's batting 368 with three homers and one steal. The minor league numbers this season were kind of interesting. A little bit of power, a little bit of speed. 7% rostered is TJ Friedel. Uh, Scott, what do you think in deeper leagues? Dickerson, Friedel. Well, Dickerson's mostly going to play against right-handers, which the Cardinals have faced a lot of those lately, helping his case. He, he's always been a guy who could hit for average, good line drive rates consistently in his career. Since leaving Colorado, there hasn't been much power to go with it. So, you know, platoon player who's not providing much power, yeah, I, I would say Corey Dickerson's upside is limited to deeper leagues. And I don't have much interest in Friedel, really. I don't I don't see him being impactful enough. Okay. On the other side, uh, a drop. John Birdie went 0 for 4, and he now has 15 games in August where he's batting 200. He's got three steals, 563 OPS. Still 52% rostered, Scott. Do you think that number is too high for John Birdie? Not if you need stolen bases. Yeah. I, I can't see dropping John Birdie in any Roto League. I mean, yeah. he had to slow down at some point, but yeah, 52% rostered covers, you know, you know, might be excluding all the points leagues, which is fine. It's drop, fine to drop them in the points league, but yeah, uh, yeah not, not, in, not anywhere where you really need those stolen bases. Yeah, I agree with that assessment. It, points league, you don't need to roster John Birdie. Uh, for what it's worth, he's rostered 61% on Yahoo, and I know those are mostly head-to-head -head categories leagues, so... Actually, more yeah. rostered there than CBS, so that actually makes sense. Some waiver wire pitchers. Not many. <laughs> There's really just one that I wanted to mention. Jose Suarez turned in a quality start up against the New York Yankees. He goes six innings, two runs, three hits, three walks. He had six strikeouts, 13 swinging strikes on 87 pitches. Uh, velocity was up in the start for Jose Suarez. Uh, fastball was up one mile per hour. His slider up nearly two miles per hour. And in his last six starts... 2.12 ERA, right around a strikeout per inning, only eight walks during that time, 45% ground ball rate, 12% swinging strike rate. Doesn't go that deep into his start, Scott, so you know in a points league, might be right. limited on the quality starts, but yeah. I think 22% rostered might be a little bit too low for Jose Suarez. I mean, it's so low. I, I think that's easy to say. If You know, you point out the 212 ERA in his past six starts. If you look at the game log, though, it it doesn't look as impressive as that. Like his previous two starts were both three earned runs in five and a third innings, which is just not a very useful start in fantasy, regardless of the format. So I Suarez has a, a, a solid slider and, um, you know, I, I think he has more talent than some of the Baltimore guys we've been talking about, but I, I, I don't see him emerging as anything more than a streamer type here over the next five weeks. Mm -hmm. I picked him up in a few of those deeper category leagues and uh, I've just been throwing him out there. And um, I hear what you're saying like past couple starts haven't been great, but overall, I mean uh, really since the second half um, he's been pretty interesting. I know he's been throwing that slider a little bit more, so that's helped with Jose Suarez, but he's just a name. If you play in deeper leagues and you need a pitcher, uh, if you play in anything deeper than that, does this guy matter at all? Javier Assad has started his major league career with nine straight scoreless innings pitched, and uh, he was at the Blue Jays, five shutout, only one strikeout in this one, Scott. Does he yeah. matter at all? I would say not. The ERA was pretty good in the minors, but the whip was high, and yeah, he hasn't he hasn't been striking anybody out so far in the majors, so no. I would ignore Javier Assad. Okay, before we hit the break, just want to... Remind you that if you enjoy the podcast, we've helped you all season long, then please feel free to give us a five-star rating, regardless of where you listen. They've got it on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. They have the rating system. It really helps other people find the podcast. And frankly, it helps us too, because if our bosses <laughs> see higher stars, then it means we're doing a good job. So if you do, uh, please give us a five-star rating. If you do so on Apple 
feel free to drop a question or a team name Tuesday in the review, and we'll, re we'll read it on an upcoming podcast. Let's take a break, and we'll hit the news and notes here on Fantasy Baseball Today. The news and notes. Tony Gonsolin was placed on the IL with a right forearm strain, and I saw a few beat writers confirm that this is a real injury, not a phantom IL stint, but who really knows? I, I don't know. Uh, manager Dave Roberts said he expects Gonsolin to only miss two starts. Yeah, I don't know if that's a real injury if, it, if it's only two starts, but whatever. And Gonsolin said something similar, that he expects it to be a, a minimal IL stay, so... Uh, you know, I'm not denying he was feeling something in his arm, but look, it, it's good news that they're both saying this. Like, it's good news. You don't want to. You don't want a serious injury for Tony Gonsolin, the kind of year he's had, and you want to be able to access him again here before it's done. All right, Stone Garrett, our guy, just hit a home run, Scotty. So. All right, thirteen. Everybody getting the in on the action. Yeah, I mean. The D-backs have some fun young hitters right now between Corbin Carroll, Jake McCarthy's doing his thing. I want to see what Stone Garrett can do, so hopefully they get him some playing time. The problem today is that they had Alec Thomas out of the lineup, so if they want to play Thomas, you know, there's just kind of a logjam going on yep. right now. So we'll see yep. who emerges uh, for the Arizona Diamondbacks. By the way, for the Dodgers, Michael Grove started on Monday in Tony Gonsolin's place. Justin Verlander was supposed to undergo an MRI on his injured calf on Monday. I haven't seen an update anywhere. Scott, have you seen anything on Verlander? I haven't. No. Okay. So maybe that didn't actually happen. Or if it did, maybe they're keeping the results hush hush for now. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of times we don't find out M MRI results till the next day. True. I'd feel better if he didn't have an MRI, you know, <laughs> they didn't think it was necessary. It's a little concerning that he is having one. Yeah. I think if, at the minimum, he he'll miss a start this week, and yeah. unfortunately, could lead to an IL stint. But you know, we'll wait. I benched see. him. I benched him in the only league where I have him, which is funny that I only have him in one league. Because remember how <laughs> how much I was hyping him? Like I, I must have drafted him in a dozen mock drafts that didn't count, and then like always happens. Everybody catches up to me on these players, and then I miss out when it does count. It's annoying. The thing is. Yeah, I think everyone saw him in spring training, Scott, and he looked healthy, and then he just like went way up the draft board, and rightfully so. It turned out to be the right yeah. thing to do. So, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the price just kept going up for Verlander, and uh, it was worth it. Zach Wheeler is planning to return next Tuesday against the Marlins. Good sign there. Obviously, that could turn out to be a two-start week for him, uh, but we shall see. Ozzy Albies is expected to begin a minor league rehab assignment during the upcoming week. See what that means for Vaughn Grissom, obviously. Byron Buxton will not travel with the Twins for its upcoming road trip, but could join later on if he shows improvement in his hip. Nestor Cortez is scheduled to throw a bullpen session on Wednesday and then live batting practice on Saturday. He went to the IL uh, last week with a groin strain, but could be back around the minimum stay. So 15 days, two weeks, something like that. Could see Nestor Cortez back in action. Luis Severino is expected to make his first rehab start on Friday. He's been on the IL since mid-July with a strained lat. Tyler Glass now faced AAA hitters in live batting practice on Sunday and is expected to repeat the activity on Wednesday. After that, he should be good to go on a rehab assignment. He's 41% rostered. Scott, I mean, what do you think of the chances that Glass now makes a fantasy impact this season? I am... Um... Glass half empty on glass now this year. I mean, they say he'll only come back as reliever. So, yeah, I just there's not enough time for him to build up. All right. Sir Anthony Dominguez was cleared to play catch on Monday. He's been on the IL for a week or so with right triceps tendonitis. Uh, it was actually Brad Hand who was pitching in the eighth inning just now and gave up that home run to Stone Garrett. Uh, Tyler Malley threw a bullpen session and a couple and a couple simulated innings on Monday. There's a chance that he will be activated when first eligible on Friday. He's been dealing with a shoulder strain. Clay oh, Holmes, did, you, did you mention Clay Holmes was working the seventh in that game? No, I was that was next up, Scotty. I mean, I accidentally skipped over it, but I was going to go back to it. Oh, all right. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, you caught it, though. I zoned out there. <laughs> uh, Clay Holmes was officially activated on the IL Monday, and he did pitch in the seventh inning. It was... A clean inning, he got one strikeout, which this is what I expected, Scott. I think they're going to try to work him back in a couple, you know, lower leverage situations early on. 
But if he looks good, yeah. you know, maybe by the weekend or even next week, they just kind of slide him back into the closer role. There was a base runner. Um, I'm not sure how the base runner reached. It was, I saw it. it there was a runner. Yeah. I don't know how he reached. Because it looks, if you just glance at the box score, it looks like it was a perfect inning for Holmes, but it wasn't. But he got a couple ground balls, which is a good sign and a strikeout. And and like, there's just, ah, there's, so just the there's just no one else left to close, I feel like. So it yeah. seems like only a matter of time, especially since this went well, I would say, his, his return from the I.L. Frankie Montas started the seventh inning. Scott, he gave up a hit. Okay. And then Clay Holmes came in. Um, he actually got a double play, was initially announced a double play. It turns out, I think, Glaber Torres missed second base yeah. or something. but uh, Overturned on review, but yeah. yeah. Uh, ultimately, it was a nice outing for Clay Holmes. And it was a really nice outing for Trevor Rogers in his most recent rehab start. He fired six no-hit innings with 12 strikeouts. And it looks like he's going to be activated when first eligible. Uh, not when first eligible, but he's on track to return this Wednesday against the Tampa Bay Rays. That is Trevor Rogers. I didn't see what he figured out, Scott, if anything, but clearly he did something right in that rehab start. He's 45% yeah. rostered. Would you be looking to re-add Trevor Rogers? I might be. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't add him over guys like David Peterson. Uh, but you know, I've been pretty pessimistic about Rogers' chances of recapturing it. Before he even went down with this injury, I had moved him outside my top 100 pitchers. But this is eye-opening. This six no-hit innings with 12 strikeouts, 24 swinging strikes. And it'd be one thing if he was doing that a high A, you know, but this is triple A. Like, somewhat legitimate there. He said, I didn't see specifically what he did differently, but he did say it was the best he's felt all year. So... I mean, we all saw what Trevor Rogers did last year, particularly the first two and a half months of last year. And uh, I think it's reason for it's reason to be hopeful, if nothing else. Trevor Rogers or Matt Manning? I may feel differently depending on how Manning's start goes tomorrow or today, I should say. But, uh, I'm, I'm going to say Manning right now. Trevor Rogers or Eduardo Rodriguez? I'll go Rogers. Trevor Rogers or M -M -M Mike Soroka? I'm going to say Rogers right now. Mm, all right. Some optimism. Let's see what he could do. Tanner Houck will throw live batting practice at AAA on Tuesday. He's been on the IL since early August due to a disc issue in his back. They've been mixing and matching some Garrett Whitlock, some John Schreiber. I think it's mostly been Garrett Whitlock, but uh, we'll see if uh, Tanner Howe can return. Trevor Larnick is expected to begin a rehab assignment on Thursday at single A. He's been on the IL for the past two months after having hernia surgery. Do have some prospect notes here. Orioles pitching prospects and one of the top pitching prospects in the game. Grayson Rodriguez will report to high A and begin a rehab assignment on Thursday. He's been on the IL since June with a lat injury. So there's a chance, there's an off chance that Grayson Rodriguez you know, comes up very late in the season, uh, but we'll let you know. Speaking of the Orioles, their outfield prospect, Colton Kowser, was promoted to AAA. I believe a first-round pick in last year's draft, right, Scott? Colton Kowser? Yeah. Yeah. I know big hit tool, uh, you know, questionable power. But mm -hmm. he has been kind of a kind of a Michael Brantley-ish profile, I would say. Yeah, Orioles, man, <laughs> they've they've got a yacht, a lot of young, exciting players coming in the next year or so. Uh, and fifth overall pick last year was Colton Kowser. Mm -hmm. And I haven't checked to see what he's done recently. I know Heston Kierstad, their first round pick in 2020. I follow him a little bit closer because I have him in the Scott White Dynasty League, obviously, but. He got off to a great start, and I think it was like a ball or something. I don't know what he's done since, but if they can get anything out of him, that would just be another. I think he's slowed down since moving up. But ah. yeah. Well, that sucks. Let's talk about some Astros prospects, Scott, because they're calling up a few different names here that I think we need to know. Uh, they've got Hunter Brown, a pitcher. He's kind of like pseudo starting pitcher, relief pitcher. Uh, both of these names are, are getting apparently going to get called up on September 1st when 
rosters expand. The other name is catcher Yainer Diaz. Um, for Hunter Brown, he's got a 255 ERA, 108 whip, well over a strikeout per inning, 23 games pitched, 14 of those being starts. He's 9% rostered. And then Yainer Diaz in the minors this season, crushing it. 306 batting average, 25 homers, 96 RBI in 105 games. <laughs> Nearly an RBI per game played this season. Uh, and he bounces around. He 50 games a catcher, 36 at first base. He even, he even has eight games in the outfield. So I don't know what the plan is, Scott, but he's kind of interesting. What do you think about Diaz and Hunter Brown? Yeah, you get those positionless players who put up big numbers in the minors. They can turn into surprising assets in fantasy if they are if they are ever able to settle into a position it probably won't be catcher if they're already moving them off catcher that much i would take that to mean Mianer diaz isn't a particularly good catcher but those numbers do catch your attention no pun intended <laughs> hunter brown is more of a conventional prospect great stuff has struggled with control throughout his minor league career, but it's gotten better this year. 3.8 walks per nine innings at triple A. Still not good, but an improvement from what he was doing in the lower minors. I would guess, and I, I would guess he's going to work mostly in relief, maybe multi inning relief, but they were already having to, uh, they, they were going six man rotation and they, they, temporarily moved Christian Javier to the um, to the bullpen because they had so many off days coming up. Even if Justin Verlander winds up on the IL, they got five men without Hunter Brown. So the artist formerly known as Roto World actually was assuming, I, I haven't seen confirmation of this, but in their update, they, they made the assumption Brown would work in relief. I, I think it's NBC Sports Edge now, right? Yeah. Um, so they were... I still type in Roto World every time I go to the website. Yeah. Well, <laughs> those those three letter networks, you know, can't can't uh can't give them too much credit. True. Yeah. True. Uh are you looking to add either of these players anywhere, Scott Hunter Brown, Gainer Diaz? Not really. In L or in L only would be a bad idea. Yeah. AL only. <laughs> Still kind of think of the Astros as an NL team, but I need to I think they're a little beyond that at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I don't know where Diaz is going to play. I, I think he's a, a pretty exciting player. And I think, look, Hunter Brown's probably already rostered in your dynasty leagues, but if Diaz isn't, then you might want to just pick him up and, and, and see where it goes in some of those deeper dynasty uh, formats. Yes, catcher eligible, I presume, right? That's the one position he's eligible at. I believe so when I looked it up earlier on CBS. Yeah, so that could give him some utility in two catcher leagues if he plays enough. It's a big if, though. They did send down Jake Myers, I saw, so that opens up a little playing time, but I doubt Yadar Diaz would be playing center field like Myers usually did. Mm -hmm. All right, so those are a few Astros prospects getting the call here. Uh, that will be likely on Thursday when rosters expand once again. All right, Scotty, let's play a little game. I've got... Name that player, and the way this is going to work, I've got a few different clues. You can just blurt out answers, Scott, whenever you want. <laughs> and you it, we'll just start. Um, and uh, yeah, if you get it right, I'll let you know, and then we'll just like talk about that player, so on and so forth. These are just like players I feel like we haven't talked about at all this season. I was scrolling up and down the the head to head points list, the roto list, and, and just seeing all right, well, wow, that that person caught my eye that they're actually ranked that highly this season. Do you have the answers in the notes or can I follow along with your clues? Am I going to spoil it for myself if I follow along with your clues here? I, I would say don't look at the clues. Like if All you right. just like click off to another tab for now, I didn't actually write the names of the players on here, but if you go ahead, if you go up ahead and, and you read the notes, then you might, you're going to spoil it for yourself. A little I got bit. I got it minimized. It's fine. All right, let's do it. Name that player. The first one up the 10th highest scoring shortstop in head to head points leagues this season, 12th highest in roto since the start of june i am batting 306 with eight home runs and nine steals since the start of june 306 batting average eight homers nine steals a little bit of pop a little bit of speed good batting average any guesses yet no i need more clues i am 26 years old and i made my debut in 2017 
2017, 26 years old. I'll give you another clue. Uh, uh, I'm okay, okay. Go ahead. Unless you, unless you have a guess. No, 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 no. It's not who I was thinking of. I know. Go ahead. This player also has outfield eligibility on CBS. <sighs> Shortstop and outfield. Um. Uh, <laughs> the last clue that I give you is undoubtedly going to give it away. So is it okay? No, is it? No. It, okay. It's Jorge Mateo, right? No, it's not. Okay. That's All a pretty right. good guess though. Okay. Go All on. right. The last one is I share my last name with a Braves outfielder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why am I having a hard time thinking of Braves outfielders? This is uh, good. Um, Ahmed Rosario. It's yes, Ahmed Rosario. It is Ahmed Rosario. Someone uh -huh. I just feel like we have not talked about much. Well, at yeah, that pow the power surprise. I that when I when I I pivoted to Jorge Mateo, I first thought Ahmed Rosario, but I was like, no, he hasn't hit eight home runs since the beginning of June. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he has. So, I mean, he didn't yeah. do, he got off to a really slow start, like did not hit for any power in the first two months. And typically, you know, you shouldn't expect power from Ahmed Rosario, but he's hitting 283 overall. He's got eight homers, 69 runs scored, 12 steals, makes a ton of contact, just a 16% strikeout rate. He's just rock solid, Scott. I mean, he just, you know, I don't think he's a huge ceiling play by any means, but he plays every day. He's got that dual eligibility and in both points for points leagues, he makes the contact and in Roto he's running a little bit. So he's just been solid. Yeah. I don't think he has the ability to be more than solid is the thing. So, you know, even if he does finish uh, as high as he ranks right now, I imagine Ahmed Rosario would be more, no more than a late round pick next year, just for the lack of ceiling. I think that's fair, but the fact that he's an outfield eligible player, just again, how bad that position has been, he's, he's been viable. So that is Ahmed Rosario. Let's move on to the next player, Scott. Are you ready? Yep. I am a top 13 second baseman in both head to head points leagues and Roto this season. Interesting that you said 13. Yes. He must be exactly 13th in one of those formats. You're exactly right. So I had to cheat <laughs> a little bit. He's 12th in one. He's 13th in the other. Okay. I forgot which, which is which. My 60 RBI are tied for sixth most among second basemen. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I got those uh, second base RBI rankings right here in the old noggin. That's Trust right. me on that. I was the third overall pick back in 2015. Oh, well, I should be able to get that. Third overall pick? I think so. 2015 was a long time ago, though. Oh, sure I know was. who it is. It sure was. Do you? I know who it is. Yep. Brendan Rodgers. That's exactly right. The last clue was if I played football, I might do the discount double check. But you don't. So you don't. No, you don't. Uh, but, you know, he, it just surprised me that I, I think, again, it goes back to like second base really hasn't been that great this year. He got to such a slow start as well. Brendan Rodgers did, but overall he's hitting 277. He's got 11 homers, 61 runs, 60 RBI. He doesn't run. I think we know at this point that is not going to be part of his skill set at all. Since the start of May, he's batting over 300, 90.5 mile per hour average exit velocity. He hits yeah. too many ground balls. Yeah. I think he's kind of like Rosario Scott in that he's probably more of a, a high floor than a ceiling play, if anything. But he's... Yeah. He's been solid. That's the word I'll use again since the start of May. Yeah, I'm a little more hopeful that he can become a power hitter moving forward, but he, he has let me down with the power production this year. And, you know, a lot of that may be what we're seeing across the board in middle infield, just uh, not as many capable 20 homer guys with the, with the ball being deadened and the, widespread use of humidors and everything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Rogers has been usable if nothing else. Yeah. And if he can maintain that high batting average, right? Like maybe he's a Ty oh, France yeah. type player, right? Like a 280 plus 15 to 18 home runs, which again is uh, yeah, is everybody just... everybody who plays half their games at Coors Field has a chance to hit for average. Right. Uh next up, are you ready, Scotty? Yep. 
I am the 19th highest scoring outfielder in head-to-head points leagues. My 77 runs scored are eighth most among outfielders this season. I've played 120 games this year, the most I've played since 2018. Scores runs, typically banged up, but staying healthy this year. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. My next clue is going to give it away. So I don't know if you have any guesses. Brandon Nimmo? Yeah. Really? Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Uh, next one was if I were a Disney movie, you'd be trying to find me. Hmm. Pretty straightforward stuff. 263 batting average, 12 homers, 77 runs. I think we're starting to see a theme here, Scott. I mean, these are just players that have played consistently this year, just kind of mm-hmm. grinding away and at a position that just hasn't really been very good. So uh, the 77 run scored, seven, 770 OPS, 10% walk rate, makes contact, and of course, much better in points leagues than he is in Roto. That is Brandon Nimmo. Yeah, and, and he's played more against left-handers than I thought he would, so that makes him, especially in points leagues, uh, he's... Did you give where he ranks in points leagues among outfielders? Because I bet yeah. it surprised a lot of people. Yeah, 19th. Yeah. 19th yep. highest scoring outfielder in head set points. Yep. Um, so, you know, leading off for a lineup that is pretty top-heavy in the Mets. I mean, obviously, they've got Lindor and they've got Pete Alonso. He's had a bunch of scoring opportunities this year. Uh, so just doing what he always does, but managing to stay healthy. It's been a solid season for Brandon Nimmo. Let's move over to some pitchers, Scotty. I am currently the SP 17 in head to head points, the SP 24 in Roto. I've got a 2.97 ERA, 3.87 XFIP, so nearly a whole run higher, but a 3.18 XERA. So I've done a really good job limiting hard contact and home runs this season. You said 2.97 ERA? 2.97 ERA. It's in the low twos since like the middle of June. <sighs> is it Logan Webb? It is not Logan Webb, but it's, you know, if you put these pictures side by side, they probably would look eerily similar. And Logan Webb's probably ranked 20 to 30 spots higher in pitcher rankings. Hmm. Yeah. They play in the same division. Okay. Tonight. Okay. So, hmm. Uh. My last I, clue is my last clue is going to give it away. It's it's going to be a giveaway, huh? Assuming, um, assuming you know this actor, which uh, you're a little bit better with the actors and and the movies and stuff than you are with music, so you probably will know who this person is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gosh, it's not coming to me. Uh, I'm thinking of the teams in the division. Is it? Oh, is it the, um, oh, oh, Tyler Anderson, not Tyler Anderson. Okay. But a good guess. I have an odd resemblance to actor Chris Elliott. Do you know who Chris Elliott is? Scott? I do know who Chris Elliott is. Yes. <laughs> they look um, exactly the same. Do they? <laughs> and I've had people point this out to me before. And I'm like, you're right. That they do look exactly the same. Who looks like Chris Elliott? <laughs> I mean, Merrill, Merrill Kelly's ERA is not that low. I know. Um, Are you sure? Is it Merrill Kelly? It is Merrill Kelly. <laughs> I, I thought his ERA was like three thirty. I know. That's why it was like so crazy to see two point nine seven okay. ERA. He's done a really good job limiting hard contact. You see that in the the X ERA according to Statcast. Uh, the home run rate is way down this year too. <laughs> he's another okay. one where he's just he's managed to stay healthy and he just keeps plugging away and he's been really good i mean the c- control has been much better he doesn't get a lot of strikeouts but mm-hmm. he's a lot like logan webb for the reasons i've mentioned so uh, especially in a head-to-head points league he goes deep into his starts he gives you quality starts surprisingly has 11 wins as well this year so mm-hmm. yeah he's been, been, been really good there, there have been a handful of pitchers like that who you know, in, in, in recent history, we would disregard them because of the strikeout rate. Even if they have a good stretch, it's like, oh, it's obviously going to win. It's, it's obviously going to end because really the only way you could make up for, like during the height of the juice ball era, really the only way you could make up for a suspect strikeout rate was to have a really high ground ball rate. 
because too much contact was just going to lead to too many home runs unless you could put the ball on the ground a ton. And the math has changed as far as that goes, which has led to some surprising pitchers like Merrill Kelly and Miles Michaelis and uh, Martin Perez and uh, a couple others too that aren't coming to mind right now. Um, and, and I'm I'm not even really sure what to say makes those guys good, you know? I'm, I'm not even really sure exactly what it is, but they've maintained it all year, which tells me they must have, they must be doing something right. I think it's related to the environment, Scott. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. the humidor is in effect and, and power being down a little bit as a result of that, but it's going to be interesting for the off season, right? Like, are we going to have more faith in these pitchers who pitch to contact? Because typically the things that we look for in pitchers are you know, swinging strikes and strikeouts. And that's what leads to upside ultimately, right? For pitchers. So I, don't I would guess not. I would, as, as far as having confidence in them going into last year, I, I would, I would say Martin Perez, Merrill Kelly, all those guys I mentioned are not going to be popular picks next year. They're going to slide very late because I, I don't think I'm alone in not really being able to pinpoint what makes them good. And that's going to make everybody highly skeptical of them. Perhaps rightfully, um, but perhaps wrongfully. <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see, I think. Yep. Last one here, Scott. I am the number one relief pitcher in Roto slash category leagues. Number one, right? It's got to be a household name, right? Starting pitcher, you said? I am the number one relief pitcher in Roto slash category leagues. Oh, okay. All right. I have nine wins, 12 saves, and 77 <laughs> strikeouts over 52 innings pitched. <laughs> it's the number one. It's crazy. Uh, it's crazy. I was just like, all right, had no uh, It's because of those wins, obviously. But um oh, is it uh Ryan Helsley? It sure is Ryan Helsley. My average fastball velocity is 99.4 miles per hour, fifth highest among qualified relievers. And the last note I had here, you might have the urge to let go of my teammate. There go my guy Egos. That's right. So yeah, Ryan Helsley has just been uh, lights out all season, just really having a breakout year. He's been used in different roles. He was you know, fireman reliever, high leverage early on. Been used, you know, more. I would say over the past month or two a as the closer. Although uh, I know, yeah, recently Gallegos has mixed in a little bit more here. Scott. Yeah, Gallegos got the last two saves. One. Yeah. One Helsley was on paternity leave, I think, and but the yeah. most recent one Helsley worked the eighth and Gallegos the ninth. That but I think I think you know that that's clearly been uh, the it, it, it was an oddity, and I don't really like basically I think of Helsley as the closer for the Cardinals these days, even yeah. if it's not a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, it was the biggest moment in the game Sunday Night Baseball. Helsley came in to face Jansby Swanson, actually gave up the three run homer which, you know, the Braves took the lead at the time. And then once the Cardinals retook the lead, Giovanni Gallegos was the young, the one who uh, picked up the save. All right, so I would say you did pretty good, Scotty. Name that player. I think so. Yeah. yeah. A couple of obscure players we just haven't talked about. It's, you know, just they've been swept under the rug this season. But let's get into the rest of Monday's action. And I want to focus on some pitchers who are struggling. For some, it's been all season long. For a few, it's been uh, just recently. But... Jose Barrios knocked around once again. He was going up against the Cubs of all teams. Five and two-thirds, 10 hits allowed, four runs allowed. The ERA now stands at 5.32 on the season. Uh, do I want to go? I'll just throw all these names at you, Scott, and we could just kind of work through each of them. Uh, Corbin Burns, he's going through something right now. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but six innings, five runs allowed against the Pirates in this one, and he's had a really rough August. Six starts, 5.68 ERA. The strikeouts are down. The swinging strike rate is down. The walks are up a little bit. His strand rate is uh, very low. So, you know, he's kind of struggling when runners get on base. That is Corbin Burns. Uh, Ranger Suarez, he's actually been much better recently. It was just a rough start against the Diamondbacks. Three and two thirds. He gave up six runs. Only two of those were earned. Uh, Frankie Montas, just another one. He gives up four runs over six innings at the Angels. He's made five starts with the Yankees now. He has a 7.14 ERA during that time. And then Carlos Rodon, not great against the Padres. He gave up five runs over four innings pitched, four hits, four walks, did not have much control here. And the velocity was down once again. Fastball velo down 1.2 miles per hour. 
the slider velo down 1.1 miles per hour for Carl Sordan. So a bunch of dis- different names here, Scotty. We could kind of talk it out, but what are you thinking about uh, Berrios, Burns, Ranger Suarez, Montas, and Rodon? Well, I think I'm done with Barrios at this point. He His previous two starts were great. Yeah. But he, he keeps doing this where, like, it's either great or it's awful, and the awful is just not worth the great uh, because, you know, despite those two great starts against the Yankees and Red Sox, he then turns in this effort against the Cubs and now has a 692 ERA just in August, even with those two great starts. 692 ERA for the month, 532 overall. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just not worth the trouble, I would say, at this point. Corbin Burns does seem to be a little off. His velocity was down a bit across the board, not too severely. Like on the cutter, his primary pitch, it was half a mile per hour, a little more on the off-speed stuff. Uh, I, I'm not alarmed yet. It's mostly like a three start blip, and this is the worst of those three starts. So I I I think he'll probably be fine, but it's something to keep an eye on. Ranger Suarez, I'm kind of done bothering with him too. Um, I will point out Scott, his previous let's see what it was. His previous seven starts before this one, he had a 1.54 ERA. Yeah, but what was his last? The last of those seven starts before this one, because it's it's two not so good in a row, right? That's true. Yeah. So, I, I don't like it. Took six starts for me to buy into him again, and then all I've known is pain since then. <laughs> Frankie Montas. What's interesting about this? So, okay, it seems like it fits with the trend of he still doesn't have a quality start in eight chances since returning from the IL, but the splitter was back in this start. Of his 15 swinging strikes, 12 came on the splitter, which he threw more than any other pitch 33% of the time. He still allowed three home runs to a bad Angels lineup, so that's unfortunate. But I, uh, overall, I'm like if if the splitter is back, they're going to be better days ahead for Frankie Montas. That was my big concern for him. Uh, maybe it'll disappear on his next start, but hopefully not. Hopefully he's got the feel for that pitch again and better days ahead. And I'm not so worried about Rodon. The velocity was down in his last start, but it was dominant. Um, so this, I'm, I'm going to chalk this one up as a blip for him right now. All right. Yeah, I noticed the same thing with Montas. It's what you wanted to see. 33% splitter usage. He had 12 whiffs on 18 splitter swings, which is just an amazing rate. So uh, it was just unfortunate to see he got tagged for those three home runs in this start. Some hitting standouts. Will Smith went one for five with his 19th home run, and he is the number two catcher in both head-to-head points and Roto this season, Scotty. JT Real Muto is now the number one catcher. He has been on fire over the past, like, two and a half months or something like that. Yep. (laughs) He didn't like me saying he was in decline. (laughs) Uh, Tommy Edmond went two for four with two RBI, and he is heating back up. Over his last seven games, he's betting 310 with two homers and two steals. Trevor Story went three for three with a walk and his 11th steal. Hunter Renfro went three for four with two RBI. And since returning from injury back in July, he's hitting 264 with 10 home runs in 38 games. That is a 39 home run pace over 150 games. Hunter Renfro has been, I would say, really good since returning from injury. So uh, helps that outfield position for sure. Uh, And then Kyle Schwarber added two hits, including his 36th home run of the season. Just two pitching leftovers here. Pablo Lopez uh, throws now two quality starts in a row. He was up against the Dodgers. Admittedly, a start we were very worried about. He goes six innings, two runs allowed, six strikeouts in this one. Velocity was actually up between 1 and 1.5 miles per hour on each of his pitches. Lowers the ERA to 3.64. And then Mike Clevenger, solid at the Giants. There was a stretch there, Scott, where we were kind of getting excited about him, but he slowed Mm -hmm. back down. It was an okay start. Five innings, two runs allowed, three strikeouts. Anything on Lopez or Clevenger? I mean, I'd gotten to the point with Lopez where I was just sitting him, even for the two-start week. I mean, it was the Dodgers and the Braves, right? I think the next one's against the Braves. Yep. (laughs) And then so, of course, he goes out and does this. Would have rather started him than Ranger Suarez in retrospect. I I don't know. I guess if he does it, because his previous start was good, too. So if he has three in a row, the last two against the Dodgers and 
Braves. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying in this scenario that he has a good start against the Braves next time out. Then I guess, I guess, I guess he's back in the circle of trust at that point. Uh, yeah. But it's it's frustrating that we're missing out on this, given the way his past couple months had gone. All right. And then some bullpen updates here for the Marlins in a tie game. Tanner Scott pitched in the seventh inning facing the bottom of the Dodgers lineup, eight, nine, and one. Uh, Dylan Floro pitched in the ninth with the game tied. He was facing five, six, and seven in their lineup. I don't know if this is indicative of things to come, but it could be. So we'll see with the Marlins. Tanner Scott struck out the side for what it's worth. That is true. I was about to tweet, oh, what can go wrong? Tanner Scott's in, in the seventh. And then he goes out and strikes out the side. So I'm yeah. happy I didn't tweet it. For the Dodgers, Craig Kimbrell pitched a clean ninth inning with the game tied. The Dodgers then took the lead. Kimbrell came back out for the 10th, uh, where he recorded one out, but also walked two. He was relieved by Chris Martin, who closed out the game for his first save of the season. So since you bring it up, I, I was looking at uh, Chris Martin's MLB.com page because he got this save. And you know how they have like a banner photo of the player at the top of his MLB.com page? Chris Martin's throwing a pitch in his, and it, I swear it looks like he's yawning. I tweeted it out. It looks like he's yawning mid-pitch. I don't think he actually is, but that's that's what it looks like. It's funny. Yeah. It's just I mean, a, like I imagine a player yawning in the middle of playing an MLB game. Well, that's what happens when you pitch for the Dodgers, right? It's just like, uh so, so easy. easy. Yeah. <laughs> the way that they're dominating everybody. Uh, for the Twins, Jorge Lopez struck out one for his 23rd save. For the Pirates, Will Crow entered in the eighth with a two run lead and a runner on first. He proceeded to give up that game tying home run to Garrett Mitchell. Will Crow then also came out for the ninth, gave up another two run homer to Kesson Hira. So he winds up taking the loss. For the Angels, they had a four to two lead. Ryan Sepera pitched in the seventh inning. He came back out for the eighth. He gave up a solo home run to Aaron Judge. And then Jimmy Herget recorded the final two outs for his fourth save. And that's now two saves in a row for Jimmy Herget of the Angels. To stream or not to stream, we'll start with Tuesday. Spencer Watkins at the Guardians. Dakota Hudson at the Reds. Eric Fetty versus the A's. Marcus Stroman at the Blue Jays. Matt Manning versus the Mariners. And Mitch Keller at the Brewers. I'm going to go with Matt Manning against the Mariners. And if I have to take a second, oh, I don't think Marcus Stroman was a choice when we looked ahead to Tuesday last time. If I had to take a second, it's probably Stroman at the Blue Jays, but I'm not thrilled with that. Yeah, he's an okay pitcher, but kind of tough matchup. Yeah. yeah. On Wednesday, we have Jose Catana at the Reds, James Caprillion at the Nationals, Anibal Sanchez versus the A's, Marco Gonzalez at the Tigers, Patrick Sandoval versus the Yankees, and Bailey Falter at the D-backs. Uh, so I had two sleeper pitchers from this group on my 10 sleeper pitchers for this week. And they were Jose Quintana at the Reds and Marco Gonzalez at the Tigers. All right, let's wrap up with some team name Tuesday, Scotty. These are actually pretty good. I, I like a good amount of the ones that we received here. These are from Tim. There's no Carol in HR. Do you know where that's from? I don't know that reference now. <laughs> so that's Charlie from it's always sunny in Philadelphia. It's, the meme or gif where he's like pointing and there's like a whole different, a bunch of things going on in the background. Do you know? Oh, he's got the, yeah, it's like, I all don't know what to call it, but the board with the strings yeah. connecting, like, right, he's right, right. you know, like he's trying to solve a case. Yeah. That's where that like famous scene is from. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, fight for your right to Marte. So he, he was trying to discover if there was a Carol in HR and that's <laughs> what you're saying. I knew I knew that the the meme was from that show, but I didn't know yeah. what he was trying to work well, out there's, there. There's a whole different bunch of things going on in that scene. <laughs> it's, okay, it's just like a bunch of people that are trying to find their mail and they don't exist. But you got to watch it. It's actually a pretty funny show. Uh, me and Julio down by the schoolyard. Alrighty, which is of course from a famous uh, Paul Simon song from Michael Whitsky for my men. Seth Beer for my horses. I think these are all song related too. So it's like Tulawitzki, but it's whiskey. Whiskey for my men, Seth Beer. Whiskey. Okay. Watch me whip. Watch me show hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. I like that one. Slim Beatty 
Okay. Hit me, baby, Quan more time. Um, that's a stretch, but okay. Ah, oh, come on, that one's good, Scotty. Snell's well, you could do it with any Juan, couldn't you? Why'd you have to wait for Quan? Anyway. Do we have any other? I guess yeah, it could be any player named Juan. But it, come on, it's Stephen Quan, so it's better. Okay. Uh, Snell's like Teen Spirit. Sure. H to the Rizzo. All righty. Stacy's Degrom has got it going on. That's pretty good. I don't think we've seen Degrom's name used that way. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, this last one is from J Ra on Apple Podcast Review. New Scootin' <laughs> Boogie, <laughs> which is yeah. apparently a country song. Oh, I yeah, it is. Boot Scootin' Boogie. Yep. Yeah. Familiar. I, I don't know anything about it. You like country music, Scott? Uh, no. I wouldn't say so. I mean, I'm not like aggressively opposed to it or anything, but this this was a little before your time. I think like early 90s. This was one of those songs you couldn't escape. No. All right. Well, I listened to it and I'm I'm pretty happy that I wasn't around for that. Then okay. we're going to wrap there. First, Scott, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.